In this video, we're going to talk about the responsibilities for auditors in finding fraud. And we're going to focus on what the AICPA says in their standard uh, for auditing. And we're going to look at Section 240. So looking at this, we've got to keep in mind what the role of the external auditor is. It is very different than just uh, an industry accountant or an internal auditor. First of all, they have legal obligations um, that are a little bit different and their focus is quite a bit different. If you think about what an auditor is supposed to do, their primary purpose is to determine that the financial statements do not have any material misstatements in them. And that is far different than finding a fraud. Now, frauds can be large enough to have a material misstatements, but there's also a lot of frauds that happen that are much smaller than nature. So in this section, um, or the statement that really defines what the auditor's responsibility is for, um, auditors are not necessarily required to find fraud. They're required to determine if there's a material misstatement in the financial statements potentially due to fraud or an unintentional error. They're not really required to determine if it's a crime, just if the financial statements are affected. So keep in mind, when we looked at uh, the global report to the nations, most of the misappropriation of frauds were smaller than what an auditor's material threshold would be in an audit of a large company. So their procedures are not really meant to discover smaller frauds, but really looking primarily at financial statement frauds or material misstatements um, in the financial statements. Now, some misappropriation of asset frauds are large enough that they should show up. And in fact, in your next portion of this module, you will watch a video of a city government that had $53 million stolen, which was definitely way beyond the material materiality threshold. So as the AICPA defines it, there are really three main objectives of the auditor. First, they should be able to identify and assess the risk. So depending on the company, what areas are there, is there the most potential for a material misstatement due to fraud? Um, and this can vary depending by industry, by company. Uh, maybe there was something in the interview of the management team that helped determine that a certain area might be riskier than others. Then uh, auditors need to obtain audit evidence. So they're going to adjust their audit procedures based on the risk that they determined and try to design and implement a response to determine whether or not there is a misstatement in the financial statements. And then of course they need to respond appropriately. So according to the AACPA, um, who has the responsibility for prevention and detection of fraud? Um, according to the statement, and I would agree with that, it is the responsibility of the governance of the entity, so usually the board of directors and the management team, so the upper management of a company, are the ones ultimately responsible for making sure there's appropriate controls in place as well as creating an atmosphere within the company that has honest and ethical behavior within the company. So if you, you know, you're talking about doing the right thing as a management team, those working for you are more likely to, you know, do the same thing and less likely to commit fraud. A lot of the companies that had large widespread frauds, you saw a lot of unethical behavior and questionable, questionable business practices starting at the top. I know I've mentioned this in other classes, but if you have the opportunity to watch the movie Smartest Guys in the Room, and we're not going to watch that in this class, 
but it really shows how toxic of a fraud, in, uh, toxic of culture was at Enron prior to their large fraud in the early 2000s. So if you ever get a chance, I highly recommend that. The board of directors also needs to, which is the governance portion of management, needs to really consider what is potential for management override of controls. Um, you can have the best document controls, but if management is not really giving support to doing the controls or outright overriding them, uh, there is a higher potential for fraud. All right, so just a few definitions as defined once again by the AICPA. So first of all, fraud, and we've looked at a couple different definitions, and this one is not much different, uh, but it does have a focus on what an external auditor would do. So fraud, you know, is an intentional act, and they're saying by one or more individuals among management or those charged with governance or employees or third parties. So that includes about everybody. Um, so an intentional act by one of these individuals that results in de uses deception. So once again, we're coming back to that lie. But here's where the one of the main differences in how the AICPA defines fraud versus others is that it's focusing on the, the end result of a misstatement in the financial statements that are the subject of the audit. So somebody stealing $1,000 every month is probably not going to show up in a material misstatement in a financial statement. So it is of lesser concern based on the statement. Now, obviously, it is a concern to the management company to find the the management of the company to find those because small frauds lead to big frauds as usual or at least historically that has been the case so fraud risk factors so what are some events that have happened maybe there's a downturn in the economy or some conditions uh you're in an industry that is declining or an industry that there's a lot of pressure to do well that indicate there might be some incentive or some pressure for those who are able to, to commit a fraud large enough um, to give us some opportunities. So companies that are really trying to achieve a goal, they're meeting expectations of management. Uh, so you're looking at that risk, or is there indications of some attitudes or rationalizations that you're seeing within the company? Uh, maybe a loose management style might kind of show that there's some indication of potential fraud or a higher opportunity for that. And then what you're looking for is significant unusual transactions. So these are the ones that are outside of your normal course of business and might be unusual. Um, a lot of sales the week before year end closing. Um, just uh, things that are not a normal type of transaction. So you want to look at those with greater care because a lot of times those are based on estimates, et cetera, that uh, you may want to look at a little bit more. So one of the key things that is pointed out in the statement is the need for auditors to have professional skepticism. <clears throat> Looking at one of the audit statements, section 230, which is the one right before this, it is an attitude that concludes a questioning mind and a critical assessment of audit evidence. So not taking everything at its face value. Um, if you get a statement from management that's not, doesn't seem quite right, you follow up. I like to use the words that you'll see actually in uh, the movie that you're going to watch in part two of module two is in the words of Ronald Reagan, trust but verify. So you have enough of a trusting attitude, but you want to double check everything. Give credence. If something sounds suspicious, you don't just let it drop. You go further. Um, so kind of keeping an open eye and looking out for everything. This audit standard does specify that an auditor can accept records and documents to be a genuine unless 
they have some reason to think that they are not, then obviously you need to dig in. So you, the other thing you are, when you're talking to people, uh, those in the management team, you're trying to look for inconsistencies or, you know, if you're getting a feeling that something is being hidden, you want to follow up further. The statement mentions that uh, there needs to be a discussion or a brainstorming activity, it even calls it, within the team. Um, and the team is to get together, and that includes from the oversight uh, partner who's overseeing to the manager um, and the whole team to start before you design the audit procedures specifically for this organization, you meet with the team and try to determine which areas are most susceptible to misstatement. This will differ by company, by industry, by if you've had this client before or it's a first time. Um, you start with the known factors that may increase incentive to fraud. You add um, some of the things that you've discovered during those initial interviews. Uh, you Discuss whether or not you feel there's a risk of management override of controls. Um, and then one of the things, and you'll get to this in your upper division accounting classes, advanced accounting, etc. What about earnings management? Uh, communication needs to continue throughout the audit as you discover more evidence. Auditors then need to determine does our risk increase in a particular area? And if it does, you'll need to adjust accordingly. And then a large portion of some of the upfront work is done with a risk assessment. You're still trying to determine where is our highest risk of misstatement during the fraud. So this includes, um, besides evidence you've gathered from preliminary documents, what conversations you've had with management, what discussions you've had with the governance body, and are you identifying any unexpected or unusual relationships? Uh, you know, individuals from other companies who may be there, th various things could be happening there. Um, all of this helps you determine your amount of fraud risk potential, you know, and what you're going to do is, based on this assessment, you'll change your audit procedures to help respond. Uh, if you see an area that's high risk, you'll do more testing, for example, or test in a different way. So what happens if you discover a fraud? Well, depending on where you find it. Now, auditors, even though they're not looking for the smaller frauds, may discover one kind of by accident or uh, the procedures happen to discover one. So then if it's at lower levels of employees, you would report to management. If you suspect management's involved, so for example, a higher level financial statement fraud, you would report to the governance body, board of directors typically. Now, if you're starting to feel that they're involved, then you have to go to the authorities. So at this point, whether or not you found fraud or not, you need to have um, a discussion, and this is probably with your legal team, uh, depending on where you're working or who somebody higher up at the public accounting firm, uh, depending on the type of fraud. If it's a smaller fraud, you report to management, they take corrective action. No, for, you would not need to report to the authorities. However, if, you, if it's something where you're suspect, where you have evidence that there is uh, a fraud being committed by upper levels of management, possibly the governing body, that is when you have to go to the SEC uh, as the authority. Now, the AICPA specifically in their recommendations does mention having legal counsel available should you have to take that step. And any public accounting firm you're working for is going to have that. All right, so that concludes our discussion of what is an auditor's responsibility to fraud.